Thank you, John. Boy, it's, uh, it's great, great, great to be back with you. Uh, thank you for all the, the folks here, the volunteers, and, and John and the team that have, have uh, put this together. It's, it's really great. So <clears throat> I'm supposed to talk about home-based abundance. You know, uh, um, one of the most, I do a lot of media interviews and things like that, and people are always saying, you know, oh, this is, this is, this is all sweet, but can, can this really feed the world? And can we really eat this way? Well, we got, in the U.S., we have 35 million acres of lawn. 35 million acres of lawn. You ready for the next one? And 36 million acres housing and feeding recreational horses. Now, not work horses, but recreational horses. Now, I'm not opposed to horses, okay? But um, that's 71 million acres. That's enough to feed the entire country without a single farm. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? So, uh, too often we think about you know, food abundance in industrial and commercial terms. You know, you look at the National Geographic and you see the pictures of the, you know, the staggered combines through the Kansas fields and you, the, the, you fly over, uh, you know, Nebraska and Kansas and the, and the big center pivot irrigations and all that stuff. And, and the truth is that, uh, that what we can do around our houses, yards, and small acreages can create true abundance and independence. So I'm going to, this is going to be really nuts and bolts here. Um, so let, let's hustle right through it. What to produce? We come in here, what do we produce? Well, what do you like to eat? There's no reason to produce something you don't like. If you don't like eggplant, don't grow eggplant. There's a lot of reason not to grow eggplant, but that's a good one. <laughs> so, so think about what you don't like to eat, or, or what you do like to eat, all right? What you do like to eat and, and, and do that. Um, next, what do you spend the most money on? You know, look at your grocery bill. Sarah just had a wonderful, I don't, don't need to repeat what she said, but look at your grocery bill. Where does your money go? And um, look at that. What fits your climate? You know, if you're living here in Ohio, there's no reason to think about growing coffee and bananas. Uh, but what fits your, cli uh, your climate? And imagine, um, you know, you can make a list of all the things that can grow here. And uh, there are a lot of things that can, can grow here. You don't have to grow potatoes in Idaho. You don't have to grow, you know, uh, cherries in Michigan. Uh, those things maybe uh, um, are not quite as easy to grow here as they do other, other, other places, but you can certainly grow things. We can extend, we can extend growth to a lot of things that, that you don't normally see. And then what fits with your interest, time, and lifestyle, okay? Plants don't move. Well, I mean, they grow but they don't run away. So think about what you can and can't do and don't get over your headlights. We've heard uh, presentations here over the last couple of days about you know, calling up and getting that cute cow before you have a corral. Is she trained to electric fence? Well, kind of. <laughs> yeah, she'll get trained when the State police and SWAT team in the interstate get shut down from that cute little cow that you petted on the nose at the guy's place and bought her and you let her out of the trailer at your place and she turned into a, you know, gazelle. <clears throat> so I'll encourage folks to, to start, and of course I'm a livestock guy, you know that, I love livestock, but start with something that doesn't move around. And that doesn't require daily care. Because a lot of times we come to this, you know, with our lifestyle, you, you're, you're working somewhere. And so, um, so think about that. Uh, seasonality, uh, leverage your seasonality. Start small. Start small so you can build confidence. Don't start with, I mean, I know a guy, he decided, he read a thing about how much money he could make with pick your own strawberries. He'd never grown a strawberry plant in his life. And he bought strawberries and planted five acres of strawberries. He never had one customer. All he had was thistles. No, no. Start with, you know, six or, six or eight strawberry plants. Build your confidence. Minimize your catastrophes. 
all right? So that's kind of the, the way I think about what you, what you want to produce. Next, a design for production, for production. All right, I'm a big believer in the permaculture zones. If you've studied permaculture at all, you know they have zones. You have your, you know, your closed zone around the house, then your next zone two, zone three, zone four. And what they basically do is start at your doorstep, and Justin talks about this, um, start at your doorstep and go out from your doorstep. Uh, so your, your herbs, your herb garden, uh, you want that right by your doorstep. That's what you're going to reach out, you know, you're going to get that for, for dinner. Um, so the things that you're going to visit every day, put those real close. The stuff you're going to uh, visit, you know, uh, not every day, go a little farther and farther. And so you, you kind of have your, your zones all the way back to the back 40. So once you decide... You kind of what, what needs a lot of attention and put that close and what needs less attention put that farther away, then you've got to be able to get there. That's called access. That's going to be everything from footpaths to vehicular all-weather all weather lanes. So, for example, one of the things that we've done this year, we're kind of revamping our, our personal garden, Teresa and I, there at the house. We're getting older, so we're making tall raised beds because I don't want to stoop over as much anymore. And, um, and so we're making them wide enough so that we can get a front end loader in there because we're using hugel culture, hugel culture with compost and soil on top and um, thinking long term. So we're making them wide enough. We can come in with a front end loader and a tractor instead of making the beds perpendicular to the center lane. We're tilting them because you can't, there's not enough room to to turn a front end loader and dump if, if, if the, if you have a center lane and the beds are perpendicular, you, you can't dump a front end loader in there because you can't wiggle the tractor in between the beds. Right. But if you tilt them, so all you got to do is just turn the front end, turn the tractor just a smidgen. You can dump a front end loader in those beds. So our beds are going to be, you know, on a diagonal and winged. So, so think about access. Um, uh, how do you get there? A lot of times it's a lot better to have a little extra access ground so that you can get to things efficiently, quickly, easily, and with some of your equipment than it is to try to compress everything real tight and then have everything by hand. And, and there, there's room for both, okay? I mean, if you've got a postage stamp backyard, you're not going to have a tractor, okay? Um, and so, so I get that. So footpaths to vehicular, all-weather lanes, you want to be able to get there all the time. Think about drainage on your access. How are you, how are you going to get the water off? Enjoy meandering accesses, all right? Um, generally, an access needs to touch as much of your land as possible. So you don't want straight lines. You want meandering so that you can touch all of your peninsulas and your, and your terrain, which brings us to the other point is work with your terrain. Don't work against your terrain. Generally, uh, when you're putting in access, you want to bring it off ridge line and above valley line so you can get water drainage. And uh, that works whether you have a small homestead or whether you have, you know, a thousand acres. Work with the terrain, meander it so that you touch as much ground as you possibly can. You'll never regret having good access. Never. Next um, is to think about water, Okay. Number one rule about water, you can't haul it. Water's heavy. It's time-consuming if you're filling up things. Um, you, you always forget, oh, shoot, I need to shut off the water. You go out there and you just, you know, about a swamp. Um, so, so you can't haul water. Pipe, bless modern times, is not expensive. You can get a pipe and you can pump water, you can gravity flow water. Remember, one third of all water that comes in rain, one third of it runs off as surface runoff. That means if you're in a 30 inch rainfall area, that's 10 inches a year runs off, one acre inch of water is 30,000 gallons. So in an area that gets 30 inches of rainfall, which this gets over that, but I'm using 30 because it's one third is easy to divide into 30, okay? Um, 10 inches times 30,000 gallons per acre inch is 300,000 gallons per acre per year. You don't need a lot of land to make, to, to put in a pond. Remember, you can use gravity. 
you know, 0.432 pounds per vertical foot gives you your pressure. You can change your flow, um, you know, by increasing a pipe. So if you don't have that much pressure, you know, you can, you can uh, increase your flow by increasing your pipe diameter at the same pounds of pressure. Your, um, well, what if, you know, what if you don't have much elevation? Well, you can, you can uh, pull a tote up in a, up in a tree, you know, an IBC tote, and you can uh, have a little bicycle pump there that you pump the water up there, and then, you know, it can, it can flow out. Uh, there's a lot of ways to use gravity. There's a, there's a lot of energy used in, in, um, in latent energy in keeping the coiled spring of a, of a pressure tank running. That's why towns and villages use water tanks, um, you know, uh, water towers, so that you can, uh, you can get a lot of flow. So you can dribble it in, dribble it in throughout the day, and then you can flow it a lot when the herd comes up to drink or you need to, you know, uh, use a, a, a flush. Um, so inventory can be stored in, in ponds. Um, cisterns, think about this, you know, every inch of rainfall generates two-thirds of a gallon per square foot of roof. One more time. Every inch of rainfall generates two-thirds of a gallon per inch of roof. So again, you know, you can do your math. I don't have time to do the math for you, but you can take that, do your math, look at your roofs, roofs on, your, on your homestead. A lot of times time you have your home, you have your little storage building, you have a little livestock barn, you know, you, you kind of have this, this, in the legal term is curtilage. You know, your curtilage is your house and the, and the, the adjacent kind of outbuildings. You can easily, easily on even a small homestead accumulate, you know, 10 to 12,000 square feet of roof, and that'll generate, you know, 30 or 40,000 gallons of water per year, which you can put in a cistern. You can have a, a, a you know, a, a just take a backhoe and dig a hole and put a liner in it. You can make a ferrous cement. You can uh, pump that water up to a, a turkey nest. A pond to get elevation. You, you, there's all sorts of well, ways to, to, to do it. The last resort is a well, in my opinion. I, 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 I like these other things because they generate additional water and they don't suck from the commons. Um, you know, most libertarians like me don't talk about the commons, but it's an important thing to talk about. If everybody sticks a straw in the aquifer and starts sucking, pretty soon there's no aquifer. If everybody starts sticking a straw in the creek, then there's, there's no creek. So I, like, I think part of our stewardship responsibility is to take the commons and, as a result of our life legacy, leave more water, leave more air, leave more soil, you know, than was there when we came. Next is control. Okay, so we've got access, we've got water, and control. That's kind of our, my three-legged stool for, for, for um, production control. Control is fencing, of course. So where are we going to, you know, what are we going to think about fencing? We'll start with givens. So if you have a lane, if you have an access lane that you're working with, it should be at least 16 feet wide. And, um, and so that's a given. You want to put a fence down both sides. That's the way you can get livestock from the, from the barn to the fields to, you know, to the corral, to a loading area, to whatever you want to, you want to do. Lanes are your, are your, your arteries. That's your, that's your access for equipment, for animals, for uh, tours, for you to walk on foot, to, to whatever. And then another a given is going to be a riparian area. If you've got a creek, fence it out. If you've got um, you know, a pond, fence it out. Steep ground, you know, our rule of thumb is if, if, if it's so steep you don't feel comfortable driving on it, it ought to either be in a woods or orchard or vineyard or something. It shouldn't be in pasture because you're not going to get on it with equipment. Forestal areas to protect uh, forests so you don't uh, graze the woods and, and, and graze down all the regrowth that's coming on. Your yard, your garden, though, that's also a given, okay? And then certainly um, a given is the corral. So, so when we start thinking about where to put fences, we, we do the, um, you know, we do, we do the givens, and then you work with whatever else you've got done. Now, if you're unsure where to run a fence, um, make it all, here's my rule of thumb, make it all temporary. If you're unsure, make it temporary, and whatever you don't move in three years, you can make it permanent. 
I can know so many places that they, 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 they start, oh, we're going to build this pretty little homestead, and they start building fences, and they're all in the wrong place. They don't work. The animals don't flow. But because it took so much emotional and economic energy to build the fence, well, you're not going to read you know, So you spend the rest of your life you know, dealing with these animals that are balling up in this awkward corner because you built the fence too soon. So, so um, make it all temporary, and then whatever you don't move and works in three years, then you can make that permanent. Make sure you get it done before you buy anything. Um, man, the worst thing in the world is to get those animals in and not be able to keep them home. Follow terrain to get your, your, to get your similar aspect in each field and, um, and make, that, make that work. Um, Justin talked about the, the two ways to keep your animals uh, sanitary, rest and sunshine, or vibrant decomposition. Um, I'm not going to work on that. All right. The next thing then is we're, as we're going toward abundance, so we've got to, we've got to design for we've got to think about what we're going to grow and what we're going to produce. Then we've got to design our landscape so it can handle that. And the next part then is stacking. That's another permaculture idea. And that's essentially instead of using linear space, we're going to use vertical space. So think about what you can what low growers that you can grow under high growers. One of the one of the um, most you know, the coolest place it ever was was a, was a place in, um, in Arizona. It was a little 12-acre farm. This family was making their full-time living on their 12-acre farm, and they had vineyard, but instead of having um, the grapevines like a normal vineyard, they had, them, uh, they had them spaced way far apart so they could run chicken shelters down through between the rows. And so they had a kind of rotation of they had vineyard, and uh, then they would run three years of chicken shelters, and then they would do a year of vegetables, and then a year of garlic, okay, um, and then go back to grass and three years of, of, of chickens in the grass. And above the, the grapes, you know, if you look at grapes in nature, where do they trellis in nature? Up a tree. Grapes love mottled shade, you know, kind of variable shade. And so these folks had put in um, apple trees in the, in the vineyard rows. And then about every, whatever, uh, 150 feet, they had a higher growing open canopy nut tree. Like this was Arizona. They had pecans, English walnuts that are kind of open canopy trees, not hickory nuts. Hickory's too opaque a canopy, but a, but a, but a gentle canopy that would allow this, so they, had, so they had, so imagine this, they had, they had either garlic, vegetables, or chickens down here at ground level, then they had grapes, then they had apples and peaches and pears, and then they had nut trees up, that stacking, and, and these guys were making, you know, great money off of a very, very small place. So think about low growers under high growers. Think about chickens under rabbits, um, chickens over pigs. You know, uh, make sure the chick, the you know, chickens. We 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 make we make tables so we can have uh, like a mezzanine in there, a, a completely portable mezzanine. You just truck it in. Fortunately, pigs can't climb very high, so even a four foot you know tabletop mezzanine with all the chicken stuff on it, you can still run pigs underneath, chickens up on on top. So you can you can take your like winter quarters, and you can uh, turn it into double the square footage by putting a portable mezzanine in it. Animals in orchard, um, hanging herb gardens on the porch, uh, barrels and culverts with pockets. One of the most uh, interesting things I ever saw was a guy in, uh, I think it was in Nigeria, and he had, he'd found a bunch of 30-inch 30 30-inch um, culverts used and cut them in 12-foot pieces, put them on edge, took an acetylene torch, cut pockets in it, and he was growing the equivalent I think it was 25, equivalent of 25 acres of broccoli in the, he stuffed them full of, of compost, dribbled water in the top, and, 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 and broccoli was growing off of these culverts. He was growing 25 acres worth of broccoli in about an acre and a half of, of, of 12 foot tall culverts packed with uh, compost. It was wonderful, wonderful. So those kind of things are all really, uh, really abundant, productive. Think about your microclimates. 
in your microclimates. If you have a pond, for example, doesn't have to be a big pond. Water uh, creates, you know, ambience. It's a, it's a mass. It holds your, you know, holds temperature. So the leeward side of a pond, our winds come from the westerlies here, uh, and so they're coming across the pond. You ever notice how, you know, on a on a, a, a cool a fall morning or a cool real early spring morning and the, and the fog coming up off a pond, right? All right, well, that's indicating the, um, the, the heat, the heat that the pond is holding and the cool ambient air so you can take the windward side where this air comes across the pond and you've got about a 20-foot zone there that you could plant things like, you know, blackberries or strawberries or... or, or uh, peach tree, something that's um, you know that's frost prone, and you can get a, a frost free pocket to use the energy mass as the water comes across the pond. Um, masonry walls, you know, again, masonry is a heat is a heat sink. So, for example, we grow fig trees. Again, we've got a we've got a terrace, um, a southern sloping terrace. So you don't use a northern slope; use a southern slope. So it's already warmer. Then you build a a masonry wall to hold a terrace, and you can plant fig trees against there. Um, and you can, what these little microclimates do is they create little, you, you, can, you can cheat your zone, okay? We're all in horticulture zones, and you can cheat your zone lots of times by one or two zones simply by using a microclimate around your, around your place. Think about reflective sides. Uh, we've used, for example, if you've got a barn side that's got... Um, uh, reflective siding, metal siding, and the sun, think about it, it's facing south, the sun is hitting it, and it's bouncing down to the ground. Chances are, out from that wall, five feet, you've got a frost-free zone that can give you an extra month or two of growing season or, or starting. And, it, and then if you, if you put your cold frame in that same spot, you've actually accentuated um, the, the, the cold frame. So, uh, reflective sides are good. Um, roof runoff. Uh, you know, if you've if you've got a an eave where you've got uh, water runoff and you've got condensation, you got a metal roof condenses in the summer. You notice how lots of times in the summer you go out on a hot July day and off your barn roof you see drip 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 water's dripping off the roof. Well, that's the cool uh, metal roof condensing the dew from the morning, and and it, it runs off the roof. Well. Put garden beds right under that under that roof, and then you can add hugel culture. You can make hugel culture beds under your barn roof. Now the animals don't grow up and make and make mud holes around the uh, around the barn, and you get advantage of all that extra runoff. And the runoff doesn't uh, create an erosion problem around the garden, uh, around the barn, because it goes into your hugel culture bed, which then grows you know magnificent plants, which can trellis up the side of the barn. Okay, are you are you, are you with me? Okay, so so you're you're identifying these these wonderful little uh, micro spots that you can get more production. Um, one of the one of the neatest things we've done is a floating garden. I saw this. I don't have any original ideas. I just steal ideas. Okay, and um, and so I, uh, this was I think in Farm Show magazine. Farm Show. You everybody get uh, Farm Show, the newspaper Farm Show. Oh, you got to get that. It's 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 great. So this guy. Um, so. You go down to Lowe's and you get a six-inch PVC pipe. You make a raft out of six-inch PVC pipe. Now the caps are going to be a quarter-inch thick, um, you know, thirty material. So the distance between each pipe is going to be about a half an inch. You put a, a board around the side. You put soil and compost in there, on top of the raft. You plant in there. You put it in the middle of your pond. Now, your pond, again, doesn't have to be real big. It can be a pretty small pond, you know, uh, 20 feet across if you want. But you can put this uh, floating um, raft in there, plant in it, and the pond becomes like a moat. So especially things like broccoli and cabbage and, you know, things that are buggy prone, you won't have any bugs in there because the bugs have to cross a moat and frogs and salamanders and amphibians and stuff that live in the pond, fish. Uh, you got bluegills in there. Bluegills will live in, goodness, you can, you can grow bluegills in a bathtub, all right? They don't need much, all right? And, um, 
And, and, and so, you know, they'll, they'll eat the, you know, as bugs try to come, they try to eat them. And, and of course, the beautiful thing is that the pond, because of the, you know, the heat mass, it makes perfect uh, ambient temperature. So there's no ambient temperature fluctuations, which is what plants love. Plants love, um, no, they, they love no uh, the temperature fluctuations. So, you know, you, you, can, you can use your, your, um, your, your mass there, your water, to help all that. So... Using your microclimates. All right. How about leaders, leaders and followers? Okay. So, you know, think about leaders and followers. Um, for example, in your garden, you know, you start, you start with frost, um, frost resistant stuff early. And then as it starts, you know, as your, as your uh, head lettuce starts to bolt and cabbage and, and broccoli starts to go down, before it actually goes down, you come in with your tomato sets. You come in with, you know, uh, other... Uh, uh, things, peppers, tomatoes, um, green beans, and you plant in there so that by the time that early, early spring crop is done, you've already got your next, your, your summer, your heat loving plants already are up seven, eight inches tall and you, and you create these seasons. And then by the, and then as you come into fall, you can go back into your, um, you know, your, your cool season stuff, you know, some, some fall peas, some, uh, you know, some beets, carrots, things like that that can take frost. And even here, you can get three crops, three uh, different cycles out of one place simply. And then if you add some, some remake cover or a little bit of, uh, you know, plastic row covers to it and, and extend the season more, then you can actually get, you know, build in additional uh, time in that. So, so leader follower works real well. Um, you know, obviously, uh, we're in livestock. Chickens following cows, or chickens following sheep. Uh, the 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 bird the bird herbivore uh, leader follower works really well, uh, including calves and cows. You know, lambs and ewes. Um, make a little creep in your in your electric fence so that the young stock can you know go out farther and they can cream stuff and and maybe go out and you know eat some things along the edge of your access lane. Help to keep that mowed. Don't worry, they'll come back to mama. All right, but they'll be able to go out and get some cream that they wouldn't be able to get otherwise confined with their with their parent stock. And then uh, another stacking idea is, is, of course, using animals to do your work. And of course, we use pigs for composting, um, chickens and ducks for bug control, that sort of thing. If you've got a, a, a very small acreage, uh, I really recommend. I don't recommend free range chickens for anything under about 50 acres because the chickens always find home and home is going to be the lawnmower handle, the, uh, the, 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 the swing on the gazebo and then, you know, uh, mama goes out to sit on the swing and she's got uh, chickens all leave calling cards wherever they go and now she gets up and she's got a bunch of chicken do or the kids track it all in the house and we all know then when mama ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. So um, think about heating greenhouses with compost and, and, uh, and animals. You, so you can heat greenhouses this way. Um, obviously chickens for composting and kitchen scraps and things like that. A moment on fertility. Um, on how are we going to keep our fertility up? We'll minimize tillage. I'm a big believer in raised beds. So you've got a lawn, you want to turn it into uh, a garden, you don't need to till it up, just go out there, put in your, uh, you know, make your, make your beds, uh, make some sort of frame, put a bunch of cardboard, everybody's got junk cardboard, you can find cardboard, put cardboard on the bottom, that'll keep the grass down, put your hugel, put your, uh, you know, slab wood and firewood and stuff on the bottom, put a a foot of um, uh, compost and soil on top, boom, you've got your bed. No tillage, no, no anything. Uh, you don't even have to use a, a broad fork. And I've got, you know, all that stuff. But, but, you know, I've become lazier and lazier the older I've gotten. And, uh, and just, you know, work with it, work with it. Um, maximize carbon. So one of the first things you want to do is to find sources of carbon in your area. I talked about this yesterday in the composting workshop. Stockpile carbon, inventory carbon, find carbon, whether it's, you know, from the neighbor's, you know, extra leaves that they would burn otherwise, bring them home, um, you know, uh, uh, give a dozen eggs to your local, um, you know, tree crew, your utility pruner crews, that sort of thing scavenge anything brown, anything that's brown, scavenge it. And finally, 
finally, abundance and, 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 and really growing abundance in your, far, in your little homestead. Use your whole family labor. Make everything child-friendly. I love garden beds, um, especially, you know, that are higher because they're so child-friendly. Um, the kids aren't going to go in and walk through the seeds you just planted and all that. You want to minimize, you want to minimize your, um, your child fuss time, okay? And you want to maximize the time that they can be really helpful. So beds clearly design, design, designate what's garden and what's not garden. The other thing about garden beds is that they make it sectional. So you can go out and you can and you say, okay, I'm going to work in bed A today, and you can. It's actually small enough that you can actually work in it and accomplish something in a small time, a small time accomplishment. This incrementalism is really important. And then, finally, uh, another you know great benefit of the whole family labor is just the emotional and spiritual abundance. We you know we we've talked about we've talked about growing food, we've talked about increasing the commons. I mean there's a lot of abundance that comes on. Probably the greatest abundance uh, that can come from what I've already talked about is the emotional and spiritual abundance in the family itself. Because the kids grow up learning work produces compensation. Tomatoes just don't happen to show up on the shelf. Milk doesn't just happen to show up in a, in a jar. Uh, you, have to, you have to work, and that relationship between work and compensation is a big deal. What we have comes from labor. There's no entitlement here. And the, and, and, and the truth is, a, another important thing is to know that things die. You know, some tomato plants don't make it. Some carrots don't make it. Some lambs don't make it. And it's important to encounter death in that intimate uh, relationship early on to know that life is bigger than me i don't have i'm not on a marionette controlling everything with with strings and the just the life lessons and character development uh add to the abundance you know our movement right now is we're in a homestead tsunami and um i'm trying to prep you for my new book coming out see uh once a marketer always a marketer but uh, this, ho- this movement is being driven a lot by, by fear of scarcity. We're, we're, we're concerned about scarcity, um, you know, when, when we don't have the dollar anymore, you know, if the Fed continues to be stupid. And, um, and, and oh, don't want to start down that rabbit hole, but, um, but right, you know, if the, and if, if the store shelves and if Putin continues and if, you know, if all these things, um, you know, defund the police and the cities burn and all that, we're, you know, what has driven our, our movement so far is fear. Um, um, and a lot of people, you know, fear makes you do things. It makes you do things you wouldn't otherwise do. But fear won't sustain a movement. What's going to sustain us is Yes, it's okay to run away. That's fine. The fire's burning, run away. But eventually, you stop, you stop running, and you have to run to something else. And so what we're actually doing is running to, the long-term sustainability is going to be running to, by faith, a new way of living, an abundant way of living, an independent way of living, and that's what this movement is about. So we're running from fear to faith, and we're br- em- embracing that. So um, my, I congratulate all of us that are here. I congratulate the team that's put on the, the summit here. I congratulate the threads and the, and the ideas that are being shared here so that we can all, it's okay to be fearful, but so that we can all gradually make that transition from fearing what we don't like out here, disentangling from the system, and actually embracing a brand new lifestyle way of living that is absolutely abundant for our families and our future and our world. Now, may all of your carrots grow long and straight. May your radishes be large but not pithy. May tomato blossom end rot affect your Monsanto neighbor's tomatoes. May the coyotes be struck blind at your pastured chickens. May all of your um, uh, culinary experiments be delectably palatable. May all of your jar lids pop. (laughs) May the rain fall gently on your fields. The wind be always at your back. Your children rise and call you blessed. May we all make our nest a better place than we inherited. God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Joel.